Hello, gentle friends. I am here today for my very first solo video, which is not terrifying at all, to pitch something to Fantasy Booktube. I am here to pitch an epic fantasy comic book series by Marjorie Liu and Sana Takeda called Monstrous, and I have two big hardcovers right here to show you. But before I get into the specifics, I wanted to give you some context because, of course, about how I got into comics and where I was at when I started this series and because I come from reading novels all my life and I didn't really read comics until mm, three, four years ago. And this was actually one of the first comics that I picked up. So this was late 2019, early 2020, uh, and uh, Carlos actually got me Monstrous Volume 1, Book 1. Here it is. For Christmas, because he had gotten back into comics and he was trying to ignite that, that spark for me. And it sounded great. It's a... Just to give you a, an idea, it's a matriarchal society, epic fantasy, gorgeous art. I'm into all of that. So I started reading it and I got about six or seven issues in and I was extremely confused because I was not very used to reading comics. I read a couple of like superhero comics and, and stuff like that, like Spider-Man, but nothing major. And I was not yet used to the looking at the art and reading the dialogue and the art being a part of the story. So I was missing things, basically. I also had this idea of comics being a quick read by default. And sure, there's less text on the page, but that does not necessarily mean that you're turning those pages quicker all the time because you're looking at the art, because the art is also informing the story and the text, and they go hand in hand. And especially with an epic fantasy story, you really need to pay attention to the world building in order to understand what's going on later on, right? And to understand the payoffs. And I wasn't really doing that. Um, I wasn't consciously not doing it, but I didn't know how to do it for a comic. The complexity of this story really took me by surprise and I was not prepared for it. And I got to a point where I felt like I had read too much to want to go back to the beginning and reread it but I hadn't paid close enough attention to be able to enjoy the story and keep going. So I stopped and I left it for a couple of years and I read a lot more comics in those years and a lot more epic fantasy as well in novel form. And I came back to Monstress last month in March. And this time I was much better prepared for it. So it was still a very interesting experience because of the things that I just mentioned. And it was my first time reading epic fantasy in comic form. And I find this a really interesting overlap of medium and genre because we see a lot of epic fantasy in, obviously, in novels. And that's what the bulk of, of fantasy booktube is. But there's also a big overlap there with manga, which I haven't stepped into yet so that's something that I find super interesting and, and still a bit intimidating just because of how differently it's read but there isn't a ton of overlap between comics and fantasy and this book really scratched that itch of taking my my favorite genre um, in a medium that I have been discovering over the last couple of years and that I've really grown to hugely appreciate and respect and gave me a whole new way to look at both of those things, which was really, really cool. That being said, it still took me by surprise just how complex and ambitious this story is. So I certainly was still coming into it with a level of bias that I was not expecting from myself. I did not think that this was going to be as complex as a live ship traders as a the name of the wind as a song of ice and fire and i'm not saying it's similar to any of those things because it's very much its own story but 
you know, there's a map, there are different cities and kingdoms and political conflicts and betrayals and factions and different fa like fantasy races that are completely new, which I wasn't expecting. So I really had to pause sometimes to keep up and like turn the pages back to a couple of issues before to be like, who was this person? Because you have to remember them visually which is different from when you're reading a book and you rely on remembering the name of somebody or the, their description and the way you remember them, which I'm, I struggle with because I'm not great at visually remembering things. Like I struggle with movies, often like period movies where everybody has the same haircut and you know the same beard or the same clothes and I don't know who's who if I don't know the actors. So I had a little bit of that where I had to really get used to looking, really looking at the art whenever a character was introduced in order to recognize them because she does not hold your hand. She really trusts you to keep up with what she's doing, which, which is cool and it really pays off because it ultimately makes it a better story. I have yet to tell you what this is actually about, so let me get a little bit into that. So like I mentioned, this is an epic fantasy set in a 1900s Asia inspired world, which is matriarchal. And this gives it some steampunk vibes that I love, but somehow it still took me by surprise when they started pulling out guns and bombs. And I was like, oh, wow, this is an interesting combination. And it also makes for some fantastic art. And we find essentially a, wo a world at war. So we have multiple factions and multiple races. We have humans and we have ancients. The ancients are anthropomorphic animal type creatures that are also immortal and they have some magical qualities that are quite mysterious. And then we have the arcanics, which are essentially half human, half ancient, but there are so many of them over the centuries or millennia that they are now their own race very much so. And we start the story and we are thrust into the middle of a conflict between the Arcanics and the humans. And the humans are controlled by some kind of witch cult. So they have their own conflict in the middle of everything, which is really interesting. And we also get a bit of a the old gods waking back up kind of flavor which has an interesting twist to it and an interesting angle that I'm not going to reveal, but that's kind of the, the setup of it. So we see these like ghosts of the dead gods and then we kind of go from there. And our main character is a young woman, a very, very angry young woman who seems to be carrying some kind of parasite, shall we say, that takes over her consciousness when it's hungry and makes her eat people. So that's fun. And have I mentioned the cats? You might have picked up if uh, you have read the Nevernight Chronicles on my little reference at the beginning of the video. So there's a, there's a whole new race in this world which are kind of magic cats and they're cats with multiple tails and they speak and there's a cat professor at the end of each issue that is like giving lectures and it gives you little tidbits of the world building, which is a really clever way I find to build in some, to spoon feed you a little bit of world building without putting any exposition into the actual dialogue. And there's a, there's a particular character who, Master Ren, if I'm remembering correctly, who is a cat. He has two or three tails. And he really reminds me of Mr. Kindly in the Nevernight Chronicles. Completely different type of creature, but he's quite sarcastic and sassy and one of my favorite characters in this whole thing. Which brings me to my next point, which is what do I love about it? And a huge part of it are the characters. I will say the first book is very much set up. We are learning what the world is, we're learning who the characters are, who the main players are, what the context of the current conflict is. So I was engaged from the beginning, hugely thanks to the absolutely gorgeous 
art, which I can't believe it's taking me this long into the video to mention. I will splice in some footage of me flipping through the art as the video goes on, just so you get an idea of what I'm gushing about. So that kept me interested from the very start. But in terms of the story, I was intrigued, but I wasn't hooked. What really, really hooked me was then towards the end of book one and into book two, where you're situated, you've understood the context very much like when you start reading a new fantasy series and for the first couple of hundred pages, depending on the series, obviously, you're still finding your feet, you're understanding the map and, you know, you're situating yourself. In book two, all of that really started to pay off. The characters are compelling, they are complex, the relationships between them are super interesting, and there's a really strong found family trope that I always love, and I really liked it here as well. There's kind of this reluctant found family of like, I don't care about you, I don't want to be around you, leave me alone, I'm a lone wolf kind of thing, but then they're not really, I just, I love that instant investment in that kind of story. And my favorite character by the end of book two is actually what I call the parasite, which I was not expecting and I find super interesting. I love when stories can do something like that and introduce something that you think is going to be an antagonist at best or just a mindless creature and it ends up becoming a really compelling character in its own right. Another thing that I really appreciated, and this is something that I probably could not have appreciated if I had stuck with it the first time I started, is the way Sana Takeda and Marjorie Liu use the medium of the comic to tell the story. And this is something that I've learned throughout reading comics in the last couple of years that has been, for me, honestly, one of the most interesting parts of getting into comics, which is understanding that it truly is a different medium and it has to be used differently than novels and the stories are told differently because it has that unique combination of being both written and visual so kind of that middle ground I find between film and fiction and but it's on the page it's static so I find it really interesting and really cool when creative teams use the paneling to good effect to tell the story. So it's not just the art and the dialogue, it's also the way the panels are arranged, the way, you know, very being very intentional about when there's a page break, about how big the panels are, about where the issues end, those kinds of things. It's not the best use of the medium. I think there's a couple that come to mind where I was absolutely mind blown with what they were able to do with a comic. The, the biggest one is actually Hawkeye by Matt Fraction, which blew my mind, uh, but also in terms of indie comics, Saga and Once in Future, I think make really good use of the medium. However, it, this monstrous does do that a little bit as well and it has a lot of splash pages where we get really large art so it knows that the art is absolutely fantastic and drop dead gorgeous i would absolutely hang prints of this art on my wall they're they're amazing uh, it doesn't have to be everybody's absolutely like favorite but for me it's it's just absolutely stunning uh, which brings me to talk about the actual physical book so i have them here this is book one, and it's. I like that it's fairly clean in terms of text on the cover, and it just has the art, here's the spine, and the back of it, it's won a bunch of awards. And then we have book two, which is even cleaner in that regard. Again, the same vibe of the cover, and then on the back we just have art, which I love that. And like I said, I'm gonna show you some of the art later in the video. Um, before I get to that though, I just wanted to touch really briefly on how this is collected because sometimes I think it gets a little bit confusing, especially if you don't read a lot of comics. Uh, so this is not a graphic novel, they're comics, so that means that they come out on a monthly or bi-monthly basis in single issues. 
Those single issues then get collected in trade paperbacks. So I have one of them here. This is volume seven, which contains six issues. So this is the last one that came out. So there are seven of these small paperbacks. And then the paperbacks get collected into these gorgeous hardcovers that I was showing you. And they contain three volumes each. So each hardcover is 18 issues. Um, at the moment, I think 42 issues are out seven paperbacks and two hardcovers. I would estimate they're coming out with a hardcover about every three-ish, two to three-ish years. Um, I think the hardcover is really worth it because the art is a little bit bigger and you have that premium format and there are books that are works of art as well as stories and if you are into the art I think it's really worth having in hardcover. You also get some extras in the hardcovers that I find super interesting to see. They're not huge in these books, I will say, but you do get some sketches of the art and how they got to certain character designs and like how a bit of the back and forth of how they agreed on what characters would look like based on the Marjorie Lou's ideas. And you also get some extra content just like a Sometimes we get interviews with the with the creative team and things like that. So it's just, it's just interesting to, to have, in my opinion. So in conclusion, <laughs> um, this is every bit as complex, compelling, well-constructed and worth your time as the big epic fantasy series that we read in novel format. It's a story of conflict, betrayal, love, loss, identity and ultimately agency. So there's loads to unpack, there's great themes, there's great characters, there's gorgeous art. There's really something for everybody here. I'm not saying it's going to be everybody's favorite thing in the world, obviously, but I think it's worth uh, giving it a go. And if you if you have read comics before, if you like comics, for sure, there's absolutely no reason for you to not give this a go if you haven't already. And if you've never read comics, but you love fantasy or epic fantasy, then maybe this can be your way in. Maybe you can give it a go and see if you might discover a whole new medium for yourself. Either way, let me know if you're interested in Monstrous, if you've read it already, if you like it, if you hate it, either way, I would love to know and I would love to chat to you in the comments. If you like the video, you know what to do. Hit the like button subscribe to the channel, that would mean a lot to us. And thank you so much for watching. See you next time.